Please stand and we will sing hymn 376. that the vestments are red and that there is a new minister in the house who happens to be of the Episcopal order. Bishop Terrell Glenn is here this morning. He will be doing confirmations at the next service. Uh, we are delighted to have him here. So greet him warmly after the service and uh, rejoice with the 10 folks who are coming to, to give their hearts to Christ in a very public and formal way later this morning. But. It is our joy to worship Almighty God and come to the throne of grace right now, is it not? So, amen. Do I have an amen? Amen. So, together, blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Blessed be you, now and forever. Amen. Together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known. perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, your never failing providence sets in order all things, both in heaven and on earth. Put away from us all hurtful things and give us those things that are profitable for us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. May be seated. A reading from the book of Deuteronomy. If among you one of your brothers should become poor, and any of your towns within your land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother, but you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need.
whatever it may be. Take care lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart, and you say, The seventh year, the year of release, is near, and your eye look grudgingly on your poor brother, and you give him nothing. And he cried to the Lord against you, and you be guilty of sin. You shall give to him freely, and your heart shall not be grudging when you give to him. Because for this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all that you undertake. For there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore, I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy and to the poor in your land. The word of the Lord. Second Epistle to the Corinthians. We want you to know, brothers, that the grace of God 
that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urged Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to, tr but, but to prove by the earnestness of, other, of others that your love also is genuine. For you know that grace that for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. And in this matter I give my judgment. This benefits you, who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also to desire to do it. So now finish doing it as well, so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened. But that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need, so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. As it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. The word of the Lord. you, Lord God. But the woman, knowing what 
But overhearing what he said is a self general ruler of the synagogue. Do not fear, only believe. And you have had no one to follow him except Peter and James and John and the brother of James. He came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue. And Jesus saw a promotion with the now, when he had mentored his sons to them, why are you making a promotion? The wind, the child is not dead, but sleeping. Then he laughed at him. And he put them all aside and took the child from the father and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talita, go. Amazement and speak the charge them that no one should know this, and told them to give her something to eat. The gospel of the Lord. Praise Please be seated. <laughs> As I begin this morning, let me say what a pleasure and privilege it is to be here among all of the saints at All Saints. I especially want to um, thank Father Fillmore for two things, for his extraordinary leadership of this parish, for the fine staff that has been assembled here, but also for the reputation of your faith, of your commitment to Christ. It is known beyond this city, it's known beyond our diocese. You're to be commended for it with all humility, but knowing that it is a gift from God, this faith that he's given you. So it's a privilege to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. As we turn to the word of God, would you pray with me? Grant, Lord God, that my message and my speech might not be in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of your spirit and of your power, that our faith might not rest on the wisdom of man, but on the power of God. In Christ's name we pray, amen. In the gospel reading that we just heard, we hear of Jesus' encounters with a multitude, but in particular with two people. It comes in the midst of Jesus returning to Capernaum where he was met by this huge crowd. Everyone clamored to get close to Jesus, to pat him on the back, to get in, to glance their way. You know how it is when there's a big crowd and a famous person, people just want to get close, somehow to connect. But there were two people among all the others who were different. Unlike all the others who were reaching out as fans, there were two who reached out in faith. And they were about as different as two people can be. One was a man who was rich, who was well-known, who was well-to-do, who was popular in the religious circuits. In fact, he was the most known religious leader in his own town, certainly in his own synagogue, as Jairus was a synagogue leader. But the other was a poor, abused, religiously outcast woman. What's interesting as we look at the story is that despite their differences, they had so much in common. Four things just leap off the page. Both, both were in a de desperate circumstance. Second, both lost all hope apart from Christ. Third, both were led to overcome fear with faith. And lastly, both received more than they thought they even needed. So let's take a look at this story. If you've got a Bible, you can turn to Mark 5 to this story. Otherwise, just take my word for it as I tell you about it. 
As Jesus is walking through Capernaum, there's this man named Jairus who comes to Jesus. And we hear in the text that his child, his daughter, his only child, was dying. Can you just capture it in your imagination? I have this idea that I think that when we read scripture we can use sanctified imagination it's especially when we read a narrative and a story is unfolding we're not going to make up things that didn't happen but the things that are recorded it's helpful sometimes to try to picture and so as this crowd surrounds Jesus and this man named Jairus comes up having left his dying daughter's bedside could you imagine doing that someone you care for so deeply that you want to make sure you're there. If they're going to die, you're there for that moment. I tell you, you don't leave the bedside of a dying child lightly. You don't leave for food. You don't leave for work. You know, there's probably only one thing you would leave for if there was a hope of a cure. And then you'd leave as quickly as you could to try to get it. This man, Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, he was the one who was responsible for who would read the Torah and who preached. He was probably wealthy. He certainly was well-known. In all likelihood, he was the most important person in town. And it's here as Jairus approaches Jesus that he does a remarkable and an unexpected thing. He comes and he falls at Jesus' feet and he asks Jesus to come to his house to heal his daughter now get the picture it is it is a picture of humility his plea is is like a prayer that we might offer to God himself it's a three-way blend of devotion to his daughter of desperation in the hour and of humble recognition that he knew that he didn't deserve Jesus's help but he was all that Jairus had left So Jesus agrees to go. No doubt as they went, hope, hope started to rise in Jairus' heart and maybe some of the others who were around who knew the circumstance. There was encouragement. It's still urgent. Let's get there quickly. But relief is on the way. We're on the way. Let's go. And Jesus, having agreed to go, presses along with him. As they went, again, imagine the crowd. There's Jesus. There's the healer. There's the wonder worker. There's the Nazarene. As they see him go, they press in tighter and tighter in order to see him, touch him, see if he'll turn to them. They had eagerly awaited Jesus' arrival. Now, now as the word is spreading out, it's Jairus' daughter. She's dying. The master's going to Jairus' house. Come quickly, everybody. They jockeyed for a front row seat for a miracle. Can't you see it? Jesus, Jairus, the disciples making their way through a mob, the word spreading, people wanting to get close to touch greatness, reaching out, touching Jesus, hitting him on the shoulder, patting him on the back, waving to him. And just then, Jesus stops. And he turns to the crowd. And verse 30 tells us this. He says, who touched my garment? It seems preposterous when you think about the scene. Everybody's crowding in. Everybody's glad-handing Jesus. And he's asking, who touched my coat? I guess the answer is kind of obvious. Everybody did. (laughs) Everybody wants a piece of you. In fact, the disciples speak up to that effect. They say the crowd is big. Everyone's pressing in. In other words, it's like they're saying, Jesus, this doesn't make sense. You're asking, who touched you? Who didn't touch you? But you see, Jesus had something else in mind. Sure, many had glad handed him, but this touch, this was different. This one was unique. One person of all those who touched him, one person had touched him in faith. And he knew it. In fact, the scriptures tell us that he perceived that it was a kingdom event where the rule and the will of God began to be manifest in a moment. 
And so in verse 30, the first part, it says this, that Jesus had perceived in himself that power had gone out from him. Mark tells us then that there was this woman who was in the crowd. She'd suffered from a bleeding condition, hemorrhaging for 12 years, and she'd spent every penny she had on medical help. You got to wonder, what did she spend it on? Well, in that day, there was a record. The Talmud tells us that for people with this, for, with a hemorrhaging condition, it preserves a record of the remedies for just such a condition. L listen to what she would have spent her money on. One remedy was drinking a goblet of wine containing a power compounded from rubber, alum, and garden crocuses. Yum. Then you could... Take a dose of Persian onions cooked in wine administered with an exclamation. Arise out of your flow of blood. Then there's another. Sudden shock. I thought that was the hiccups. Or carrying the ash of an ostrich egg in a special cloth. And would you believe nothing worked? Yeah, you, you think? And to make matters worse... She spent every penny she had on it so that all the physicians said there's nothing more we can do. Oh, it does get worse because that condition she had, it made her a religious outcast. It made her ceremonially unclean according to Leviticus chapter 15. That meant no public worship, no temple participation, no public contact. Even the places where she sat became unclean. So there she is, poor, scorned, unwelcomed, avoided, discarded, abused. But listen again to verse 28. But what she determined was that if she could but touch Jesus' garment, she would be healed. Do you notice the strange mix of faith and a little bit of superstition? If I could just touch the hem of his garment... It'll be enough. If I could sneak up behind him, nobody noticing, certainly not him, and just touch the edge of his cloak. You see, unlike Jairus, who comes to Jesus boldly, she comes from behind hoping to go unnoticed. But just like Jairus, she was in a desperate circumstance and had lost all hope apart from Jesus. And so she literally crawls up behind him and she touches the garment and the scriptures say and then she was healed and now Jesus wants to know who touched him who touched my clothes you know at first glance if you didn't really know Jesus you would think why is he humiliating her why is he calling her out in the midst of a crowd, it almost seems that way. But listen again to the words at the end of the encounter where he says this, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Take it apart. Daughter, do you realize what Jesus is saying to this outcast? You're in the family. You belong. You're one of us. He personalizes it. He's saying, don't crawl along to be healed. Stand up whole. Daughter, your faith, in other words, it's not the garment. He addresses the superstitious part, and then he reveals the truth. Your faith, your faith, which you put in me. He personalizes her faith even more deeply. And then he tells her, go in peace. This woman who, when found out, the scriptures say, was terrified that now all would be known. And if she thought she was an outcast before, it'll be even worse. But now Jesus says, peace. Go in peace. Your turmoil has ended. And Jesus didn't just whisper it in her ear. It was a public proclamation for everyone to hear it was as if he was saying, this outcast, this woman is now whole. Take her back. I have. She is healed, restored, returned. In fact, the word he uses is a form of the word sozidzo, which means she is saved. Turn, which she did, 
and trust, which she did. Jairus was watching the whole thing. Jairus, whose daughter was at the point of death. Jairus, whose hope began to rise when Jesus said, I'll come, and they made their way through the crowd. Could you imagine what this whole exchange was like for Jairus? This, this is wasting time. Don't you guys get it? My daughter is dying. And Jesus stops and asks a question like, who touched my garment? And then has an exchange with this outcast woman. For Jairus, the interruption was kind of a bad news, good news thing. No doubt he wanted the crowd to disperse. He wanted Jesus to be able to get on his way. He wanted this woman to be dealt with quickly. It was bad because it was a delay. It probably agitated him further. His daughter was dying. This woman was just suffering. She was a nobody. He was a somebody. But at the same time, he watched her be healed. He heard the declaration from the Lord that she belonged. Jesus commended the faith of the woman. Jairus was trusting Jesus too. Certainly Jairus' hope was starting to grow even larger. But even as Jesus was still speaking with the woman, Mark tells us that someone approached Jairus with news from his house. Your daughter's dead. Could you imagine his heart? It sank, it crashed, crushed into a million pieces. I mean, how, how do you keep resentment at bay over this delay in getting home? Now, news spread throughout the crowd where no doubt, for their part, they were discouraged. No miracles today, just a funeral, because the funeral would happen that day. But look at what Jesus does. Jesus seizes the moment with Jairus and he says this do not fear only believe in other words he's saying get your eyes off of everything except me turn to me and trust me and as with the woman who approaches Jesus with great fear Jesus calls for and he commends great faith have you ever noticed the relationship between faith and fear? That so often our fear comes when we place our faith in negative possibilities. When of all the possibilities of those things that could happen in life, we begin to trust that a certain bad one's going to happen. And then fear rises. That's not all bad. Because if a tiger is coming at you and you focus on the possibility that you're about to be devoured, that's actually a good thing, that you might respond to that. But so often, we're not being attacked by a tiger when we look at a negative possibility in life and then begin to put our faith in it. No stifling fear, paralyzing fear, it comes from misinvested faith, faith placed in negative possibilities, a faith placed in the negative, disastrous possibility. And so Jesus turns to Jairus, who just heard that it's gone from a sick daughter to a dead daughter. He says to him, put your faith in me. He's calling him to consider where are you trusting right now? Where is it planted Jesus is calling Jairus to rise above the calamitous possibility and to trust him. And since the momentum of a mob's fickle leanings is of no use to faith, Jesus thins the crowd, telling everybody to leave. You're not going to see what you came to see. It's interesting. They weren't going to see what they came to see. They wanted to see a healing. He was going to raise from the dead. And so he just takes three disciples with him. Jesus commended the faith of the woman, and now he's calling for faith in Jairus. So Peter, James, and John, what he was about to do was not to be a public spectacle, spectacle for gawkers, but a revelation of who Jesus really is, the breaking in of the kingdom of God. Verse 38, once at Jairus' house, he saw this huge commotion. There was weeping, loud wailing. Now, certainly some of the grief was real, but 
Do you know that in Jesus' day, at a funeral, there was actually a funeral service because the funerals were all done the day of. And so there would actually, especially for people who had some money, there would be professional mourners who would be brought in, professional musicians, but professional wailers who would heighten the sense of grief over the loss. Burial done the same day, you'd hire a mourner even if you were poor. You were required to hire two flute players and one mourner in the event of a wife's death. And Jairus being prominent and probably wealthy, there would have been a band. And Jesus tells all of them to leave. Verse 39, Jesus tells them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child's not dead, but is sleeping. And as an indication that there were pros there that day for the funeral, they laughed at Jesus. Going from grief to laughter in just a moment, you only do that if you're not personally attached. And Jesus goes to the room and takes the child by the hand and with tenderness, the tenderness like a mother with her young, waking them up from a deep sleep to a new day's adventure, Jesus says, little girl, I say to you, arise. It's as if Jesus was saying, hey, sweetheart, it's time to get up. Funeral canceled. Amazing what Jesus does. But what are we to do with a story like this? Well, hold on to three thoughts. The first is this. Jesus is once again showing us exactly who he is. He is the Lord of life. You realize what Jesus doesn't do at any point in this story, whether it was with Jairus coming and bowing down before him or the woman coming and touching his garment and his interaction with her or the news that there is a death in the family now and what are we going to do? We never see Jesus frenzied, never see him anxious, never see him overwhelmed like, oh no, what will we do now? Because if I was in Jesus' shoes, do you know what you get from me? Oh no, what are we going to do now? You ever see that in the scriptures? You can't really push Jesus' buttons. He's this non-anxious, well-individuated presence in the midst of a chaotic world because he is Lord of all. What else do we do this? We remember this, what he can do. Jesus can heal the sick. He can raise the dead. He can restore the outcast. He can bring hope to the, to the hopeless. What is it in your life right now that you are wondering, but Jesus, can you do this? Well, yes, he can. And then notice how we connect. It's not superstition. It's not incantations, it's faith, it's trust. You know what trust is like? Trust is where we make ourselves remarkably vulnerable to all the possibilities that the object of our trust can do or be to us. Think about it. The chairs you're in, you trust them. What do I mean by trust them? Well, you're making yourself vulnerable to all the possibilities of what the, tr what the chair, the object of your trust, can do or be to you. Now, you're believing that it will hold you up, but what you don't know is that this morning I came in with a screwdriver and unscrewed every single screw, and they're on the brink of collapse. But you're making yourself vulnerable to all the possibilities. <laughs> Ever gotten on an elevator? Where you get up on the 10th floor and the thing is supposed to take you down to the bottom trust and you're trusting you're making yourself vulnerable to all the possibilities of what the object of your trust a box suspended by cables 10 stories high of what it could do to you and what could it do to you well actually it could go down slowly and let you out at the first floor but what else could it do it could crash and you could die and who is otis anyway but you get in it because that's what trust is. You see, so often we think, oh, but my faith is so small, it's so whittled down, it may be. The question isn't how large is it, it's where have you put it? And with Jairus, 
he says, trust me. And with the woman, he commends that she trusted him as the Lord of all possibilities in the midst of possibilities both positive and negative so that fear is banished and trust is placed in Christ. What is it right now that by putting your trust in Jesus, you would be making yourself vulnerable to all the possibilities that the object of your trust, who is Jesus, could be or do to you? What better place to put it? Because we know he loves us and he cares for us. We know what he can do and we know who he is. So you can trust him. Amen. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is and glorified. So that through the prophets, we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We believe not in the baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray for the church and for the world, saying, Hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For Foley, our Archbishop, and Stephen, our Bishop, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation. Lord, in your mercy. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others. Lord, in your mercy, for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith. Lord, in your mercy, for a nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially Joseph, our president, Roy, our governor, our legislators in courts, and those in the armed services. Lord, in your mercy, for all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. Lord, 
in your mercy. For all those who have departed this life in, in the certain hope of the resurrection, in thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy. I pray. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. The glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Please stand. Join us up front. Beloved in Christ, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Peace, brother. Good word. seated. Welcome to those who are visiting with us today. We hope that you're well and blessed. Love to get together with you and uh, talk about church membership or whatever. Welcome Bishop Glenn. We're delighted to have you here. Um, North Carolina is in the process of organizing itself a little bit differently where Bishop Stephen will continue to be our diocesan bishop but as the diocese has grown, now we have area bishops and Terrell Glenn is now our area bishop for North Carolina. So we, we will be seeing him more and more often. He will be doing uh, confirmations at 1030 uh, today. So we have two tier membership in the ACNA uh, baptized member and then confirmed member. So if you wanna be a baptized member, uh, do a newcomers class that will be on the 17th of July as the next one and we will outline the history, the beliefs and all of that of the Anglican Church, our own particular history as All Saints Anglican Church and, and what the responsibilities are for a member. We hand you a piece of paper that you sign on the dotted line and then you are a member. So there's that. Today we're gonna to do something that we used to do every Sunday in the world but we haven't been doing in the pandemic. We're gonna pass the plate. Now, I know there's a, I was told this morning, a church in Raleigh where 95% of the giving is online now. Ours is coming up towards 50%, I think, at last, last we checked. Um, this Sunday is GAFCON Sunday, and of course, everybody knows what GAFCON is, right? Not at all. That's the global Anglican future. Thank you, George. See that hand, brother? Um, <laughs> That is the group of international archbishops who got together and said to the American faithful, 
you guys need to form your own Anglican province. And so they're the ones who, who really gave birth to who we are. Uh, most of us think of the church as the local church, but there are things going on overhead that really make it possible for us to, to have a witness. So this is GAFCON Sunday, and we have a request from our higher ups that each person in the church would give not $100, not $50. Each person would give $1. So we're gonna pass the plate, and if you could give $1, then we have fulfilled our our ask for that. We're doing parish uh, covered dish picnics every month. That is this afternoon at five o'clock. We'll be right out here. It should be a wonderful time. So uh, see us there. Let us worship the Lord with music. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. You're exalted as head above all. All things come from you, O Lord, and of your own have we given you. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. 
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, our duty and our joy always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent your son, only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death, we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And we celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O oh Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also, that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him in the fullness of time. Put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed once for all upon the cross. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. We do not presume to come to this, your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen.
gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you. And feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
offer this prayer for those who are not with us physically, but are, who are watching uh, over the video. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would send the healing spirit of Jesus into the minds and bodies and spirits of those who cannot, for any reason, be here with us this day. We pray, Lord, especially you would comfort those who mourn. Father, we pray that you would fix their hearts firmly on your grace. In their minds, Lord, help them to remember time after time after time how you've been so faithful. And in your good time, Lord Jesus, we pray, raise them up. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you've given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. All our problems we send to the cross of Christ. All our difficulties we send to the cross of Christ. All the devil's works we send to the cross of Christ. All our hopes we set on the risen Christ. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, who is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen.
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks to God.